This week we're going to finish up our discussion of juvenile justice and we're going to look at the future of juvenile justice and particularly um, how the problems of today's society can affect juveniles, the major issues that are facing juvenile justice. Um, we're going to talk about the changing face of juvenile justice, explain what professionalism is and how it can affect juvenile justice, and then finally discuss what it will look like it being juvenile justice in the years to come. So first let's summarize how the problems of today's modern society can affect. And one is that uh, the American family has changed dramatically over the past few decades. Um, both parents have had to return to work. I discussed how um, what an impact it was when we moved from an agricultural society to an industrial society and that when most um, places were um, farms then you worked right alongside your dad or your grandpa or your grandmother or your, gra or your mom and so they were able to instill within you and spend a lot of time with you talking about um, morals and ethics and, and why it, it, you should take pride in your family name and those sorts of things. Um, but with the increased cost of having families, it has meant that m children find themselves on their own much more. You've heard the term latchkey kids where um, children come home from school and there's that time in between uh, coming home from school and when your parents come home. So what happens at that time? Um, many children uh, at, there's an increase of dysfunctional families uh, where you see uh, neglect, abuse, um, and children may or may not receive the love and affection and the acceptance that they need and what impact does that have. So then, again, nothing new that we haven't talked about, but children may then decide to um, substitute these families and, and to join gangs that provide them the roots that they're looking for, the respect and the identity. Okay. We also find in today's society that there's great disparity between the rich and the poor. Um, our underclass is expanding, so joblessness, inadequate housing, bad neighborhoods, ineffective schooling, all of these things are, are playing a part and affect juveniles. Inner city neighborhoods, um, again with the gangs um, and the different ethnic groups and residents of these communities are poor. Many times they face prejudice or they just feel powerless like telling them you can get a job, go to college, have a new way of life is like telling them they could fly to the moon. Um, they see just as many barriers to the first option as they do to the second. Schools, um, particularly inner city schools, have become very problematic for both students and teachers to feel safe and secure um, and juveniles can often get caught up in environments um, where they're making poor grades disruption within the classroom is very prevalent they may choose to skip school maybe be suspended join gangs drugs drop out so all of these things impact um, juveniles and how they interact with our society when we look at issues within criminal justice uh, we are continuing to rely on the gift get tough approach you see it in the news all the time and you know we need to think about what that means what that means in our society what it means for the children um, there's also fiscal challenges you know every everywhere money is tight since the recession uh, we find there's still high rates of recidivism in juvenile justice so it, trying to determine why is it that they keep coming back? Um, we are still finding discrimination in regards to race or ethnicity and in regards to gender and processing and also noticing that there is a victimization of weak or passive youth in juvenile institutions. If you, can't, if you don't stand up for yourself you're more likely to be a victim. So what about the future? Um, we're entering a new phase that's called techno corrections, which uses technology rather than personnel to monitor probation, aftercare, and even institutional populations. So, um, you know, um, 
electronic monitoring is becoming more prevalent so you don't have to have as many probation officers because they can look on a screen and see exactly where all of their probationers are at. Um, there is a danger uh, to this technology driven corrections and that is that it isolates the environment for both probationers and inmates. There's no longer that physical contact so who's going to be a mentor, who's going to help show them um, what's the correct way to interact with society if it's always through a computer system. Restorative justice emphasizes accountability um, and that is continuing to grow and the goal if you recall of restorative justice is to repair injuries to the victims in the communities try to get them back to their original state as much as possible. We're also beginning to look a lot more uh, at evidence-based principles. So finding out if we put this program into place, what's the evidence that it's working? No longer just assuming that a program works, but looking at what are the evidence. So professionals feel that these programs have a better chance of succeeding if we are constantly looking at the evidence that it works. Um, in your textbook, you'll find that there are 10 evidence-based principles that target changes that we feel as researchers can realistically be accomplished. And your textbook goes into more detail and I'm not going to read this to you entirely but I wanted to pull out um, a few. One is number four, using a cognitive behavioral approach and that is really striving to help juveniles make the mental connection to how their actions create results. So if they choose to rob a bank, yes, they get the money, but what are the additional ramifications of their choices? Um, looking at providing intensive services, so again, getting that one-to-one -one contact, or more personal contact, probably it will never be one-to-one, -one, but more personal contact where they're interacting with someone. Community-based services continues to grow. And then number 10 I think is very important is reinforcing the integrity of services. And that's one thing that you, as, as someone who wants to work in the criminal justice system, we're striving to increase our integrity and reinforce our integrity because we are the crux of the juvenile justice system and the criminal justice system. So if we don't have integrity, our programs don't have integrity. Uh, we also want to look at the emphasis on reentry, and we found in our research, and we talked about this, I think it was chapter 14, where we focused on reentry, that aftercare services are crucial, that we can't just have juveniles do their time and then push them out the door and say, don't do it again. There has to be that critical step in between where we focus on how to get them into the community and working well within the community. I also wanted to touch on professionalism and the importance. Um, with individuals who are working in the system, it's important that they receive the training, the education, um, to be aware of affirmative action, to be aware of issues facing other races and ethnicity, not just their own, and just have this dignity and respect throughout our juvenile system. Textbook talks about these attitudes of professionalism and to consider um, someone a professional, we, we find that they have these types of attitudes or these characteristics, that they treat the offenders with dignity and respect, um, that they model their positive behavior, and that they believe it is possible to make a difference. I think that one's critical, and that one's probably the hardest one after you've worked in the system for years and years and years to uh, you tend to focus on the ones that don't make it and skip over the ones that do and you really have to focus on the ones that do make it even though percentage wise they're they're fewer um, to stay positive to refuse to accept unethical behavior from fellow staff members again I can't stress that one enough how the crux of criminal justice really relies on the people and making sure everyone's ethical and professional and making the right decisions. So what will it look like? Um, the population of juveniles under age 18 will increase. Uh, many of the juveniles we expect will be impoverished and from minority groups. They will be have been raised by single parents. The rates of violence will increase and the use of drug courts, teen courts, gun courts and restorative justice is going to increase. 
Um, we do foresee that gangs, drugs, and guns will continue to be a problem within the juvenile justice system. And despite the purpose and the efforts of that Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act that we've discussed, we still feel in the future we're still going to have um, concerns and issues about a disproportionate um, amount of our juveniles are minorities. So in summary, um, we find that families, your economic structure, your neighborhood, your schools, and if you're involved in a gang along with your attitudes influ influences juvenile behavior. Again, this is a good review for all the chapters um, that we've talked about in this class. Um, it's going to continue, we feel, to influence juvenile behavior that our get-touch approach, our lack of finances, um, dealing with recidivism, discrimination, and victimization are issues that currently face juvenile justice and we see many of them continuing uh, to be an issue. The future of juvenile justice is likely to include an increased use of technology, um, restorative justice, and evidence-based practices. I hope after reading this chapter you've walked away with um, an understanding of how important professionalism is and will continue to be um, within the criminal justice system, not only with uh, juvenile delinquents. And that more impoverished minorities from single parent homes that are involved in gangs, drugs, and guns appear to be the, the future of our juvenile justice system and the crux of the types of individuals that we will be dealing with.